we have the absolute pleasure of welcoming Christian Falk on the podcast. Christian, how are you? I'm fine. Servus from Munich. I love that. I love that. First time we have a, uh, a, a, a guest in Germany, I think. I'm trying to record all the other ones. But I'd like to start, Christian, actually, where you have a new book coming out uh, by an insider. Um, and we've, as we've laid out in the intro, you are the Bayern Insider. I'd like to know first why, why now, why do you think it was a good time to to write um, to write this book? Yeah, as you know, it's my second book. Uh, the first one um, is about the period about uh, I think twenty years so when I started as a journalist and perhaps also like a little fan. And um, it was about how do you get a journalist, how it is to work with the stars, how was it in further times when you were standing outside the pitch and just um, with your, yeah, you had a pen <laughs> and then you had to a press conference and then you go into the office and you write and for 12 or 16 hours, you were the only person with five colleagues in the world who know the news and everybody had to wait till the next day. And um, yes, and um, it was also because of me and Bastian Schweinsteiger because we are from the same area, we are quite the same age, okay, he's younger, but mm -hmm. we started our career also at the same time. And um, the book ended at the World Cup 2014 uh, when Schweinsteiger was champion, I was with him as a journalist. Yes, and I thought now uh, I have a break and I don't have to write so early, it was last year mm -hmm. when it was published. Yeah, and Bayern Munich uh, was winning the Champions League again. And I said, oh, and so many things were happening the last years till six, seven years ago because journalism uh, was completely changing because of the internet, because of everything. And so I thought, okay, it was lockdown again, sit down and write the next story. Yeah, no, it's a good time, it seems seems for many. Uh, I can't personally wait to, to, to read it. Like I mentioned to you before we went, on air, so to speak, you are my German teacher now by me listening to your podcast. So this will be another uh, a nice welcomed addition to the to the teachings. On that topic, then you say how journalism changed, and like everyone else, you've you've worked yourself towards an incredible standing. You are a very reliable, very reliable voice within German football and internationally. As we talk about journalism expanding, as opposed to five people knowing what's going on in Bayern. The, the, the audience is expanded in sorts. So how was it for you to start going from the very beginning in terms of building a network, building a reputation, getting to know the right people? And how does it compare to, to where you are now? Hmm. Yes, you know, at the beginning, because um, when you're a journalist, um, you're writing for a newspaper, or I'm also writing for our magazines, Sport, Build and Build. And uh, at first you were just... Um, there for writing to your magazine or your newspaper because you want to sell it and the people has have to know from there and then they have to pay for it and um, yes and you can't go anywhere and say okay I make my own thing because I'm an employer <laughs> I have to work yeah. there but uh, in the end um, you can't stop what is around on news you know the years before the journalist was was a gatekeeper we could decide which news is going out and which news is behind right. the wall of knowledge and uh, uh, we keep and our insiders with our insights. So, but you can't stop the news anymore. And uh, I saw that uh, there's so many fake news, you know, everywhere and everybody can publish his own news and nobody knows, hey, which is reliable, which is true, which is not true. And then I said, okay, um, my position as journalist has changed. I'm not only there, for creating news or to find something out uh, or write a secret. My job is now uh, also to say the people believe in that, don't believe in that, this is true or this is not true. Or if it's true, this is the thing behind the scene because a new, you can read it on Twitter and say, oh, okay, this is a news. Oh. But the story behind the news is always, I think, more interesting. And um, this is our job now. Yes. And hence, where you're saying what you become known for on, on Twitter with true or not true is, is a reflection of that, I, I assume, where there is you, it's your responsibility almost to, to filter what is fake, not true, to what is true. And I think that's more important than ever when uh, 
alternative truths are found across audiences. And I think that's, that's an issue. And so you touched upon how it's changed, how you approach you telling the news, so to speak. But how I want to go to the beginning. How was it for you? Because you started at some point without a name, so to speak, you know, and you have to go by and, and, and building that network, building that reputation. Was there, was there a plan in your head at the time as to how you went by it? Was it a result of just pure resilience? How did you, how did you go by that in, in the beginning? You know, at first, I think uh, it's always um, having connections. You know, you have to start because I remember when, <laughs> when Vicente Lizarazu was playing at Bayern Munich. Mm -hmm. um, I was a young journalist and I was standing there. I was, a, when it was windy, when it was rainy, I was the first at the pitch and I was watching and I was the last reporter who was going home or in the office because sometimes you have to, to stay there and say, oh, I have two hours left for my article. I have one hour left for my article. So uh, it's not always so easy to stand there right. <laughs> till the end. And uh, one day, Vicente, he was there making yoga, which was not so famous at this time. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I don't know, which uh, I think it's called uh, Greeting the Sun, I think. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sun, sun salutation. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the name in English. And um, then uh, I was watching him and he wasn't, talking so much to journalists at this time uh, his German was not so good and uh, but he saw me and then he came out and said to me I see you I see you every day you're always the first and you're always the last right. and I just wanted to tell you I see that and you're cool. doing a good job and this was a uh, very very nice from him and yeah. so um, after this sentence we had a relationship and it grows and I think this is the point and um, you have to be there that's the first thing, um, get the connection, get the model numbers, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, with this, um, you are working on your network. And when you have your network, um, it's easier to start the other things. Because um, if I can't call anybody, I never will know if it's true or if it's not true. So this right. is the first step. And the second step was that uh, I realized it has to be uh, also the reporter, the people want to follow. It's not only the newspaper. They, I really like if you say, somebody is saying, I read Bild because Christian Falk is writing for Bild. He's the man on Twitter or he's the man on Facebook or he's the man on Insta or he's reading my blog or listening to my podcast or to the TV show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he shouldn't care where he get the information, but it's important to get it from this one guy and said, Oh, I, I trust him. And so also Bilt says, hey, that's good because the people trust him. He's writing for us. And so it's a win-win situation for everybody. Mm, absolutely. And on that topic, then, I, I love the story about, about Lizzo Razou because I think as, as footballers as well, they know the result of, of, of hard work and, and being at the ground all the time. And for him to recognize that, I think uh, says a lot about him as well. But on that topic, then, you know, on the you talk about not true, not true, having your sources. I think, imagine one of the hardest parts in your position is forming genuine, intimate, good relationships with people, with players, directors, other journalists, what have you, but at the same time, having a responsibility to report on the truth, so to speak. And I imagine that in some cases, maybe these stories could maybe upset people or they feel like their toes have been stepped on or whatnot. How do you work around finding that balance? Because it's, it's tough, isn't it? Yeah, you mentioned the most interesting part of the job and the most difficult one. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. really a very big point in my first book because I told you about Bastian Schweinsteiger and me. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, you know, um, when I was young and he was a little bit younger, uh, it was like... Um, Yes, perhaps I wouldn't say friends, but we were one generation and uh, I was invited to his birthday party. Uh, we played on his PlayStation. But um, then there is a point, one point you have to decide, are you a journalist or are you a friend? And I had to write an article and it was not very a very nice one about Basti. And uh, perhaps I was too hard. Perhaps I was too hard because I said, uh, I have to be hard because I have to show that I'm not only his friend, 
Mm -hmm. I have to show that on show notes. Perhaps I was a little bit too hard. It was an uh, article called his uh, Chefchen, Chefchen Schweini. That means a mini boss. Uh, right. That sounds not so hard in this moment, but uh, at this time it was hard. And he was really, very really angry. He blamed me on the press conference. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> he said a few not nice words. And uh, yes, after that, there was a break in our relationship, a really long break. It was seven years. We didn't uh, talk one word with each other. Mm. Uh, I wrote some stories he didn't like. He didn't talk with me and said some things behind uh, me, which were also not so nice. Yeah, it was seven years. Uh, we uh, were not friends. Uh, I wouldn't say enemies, but uh, it was it's really a hard time in a relationship because he was very, very important. Uh, he was the captain of the national team at last, and he was always a leader. And um, But it was one point and when he saw that uh, I'm not angry on him and I don't write it because I want to uh, hurt him. Uh, he realized it. It was at the end of his career. He was already in Chicago. And um, I wrote a few articles about him, which were nice because I thought this is right and not to be nice to him. Right. And um, at this point, uh, we find together. And he, I said, um, Basti, when you want to talk, I'm always there. I go into the plane. And then the call was coming. <laughs> it was the day of... Uh, German Cup final. I was in Berlin and shouldn't go. Should go to the stadium, indeed, right. and watch Bayern against Leipzig. But then he said, "If you want to come, come now." And so I took the plane <laughs> to Chicago, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we were sitting there. And uh, I think it took five minutes, and uh, we had the same relationship like seven years ago. We were laughing. We were talking about old times. He wasn't so, um, you know, when, when you're on the top and you're the professional and you just see football. Yeah. It wasn't so easy for him to see my side. Perhaps I was a little bit angry because he didn't talk to me so, uh, this times uh, because I did my job. That was my view. And uh, But at this time, he had children like me. Uh, he was thinking back of his career. And uh, so we could laugh about it. And yes, I think now we have a better relationship than even before. But as you said, uh, sometimes it's not so easy to be a journalist. That's oh, a brilliant story. I appreciate you sharing that, Christian. I think, yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of questions I could derive from it. I guess, you know, you're both older in that sense. So for him to be able to, to reflect if that's because I don't know if in your interaction with players are players, the players you work with now, or is it depending on when they are in their career in terms of it being easier or harder to work with players? Do you, is it more, is it a generational thing or is it, at what age they are in their, yeah, at what age they are in their career that de that decides if they are easier to talk to. If you understand what I'm saying, that's yes, it's it's not a. Of course, uh, it's there's a time where you go with them into bars. Uh, I we had the same, uh, yeah. How do you call it a scissor <laughs> when you mm -hmm. made the hair at the same? Yeah, the haircut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there were some times we were going. After the match, we were meeting in the discotheque, uh, P1, very famous in Munich at all the times. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, but there is a time for that and there's a time for the another one. And now, you know, uh, like Thomas Müller, uh, he's really a lot younger than me, but uh, he's understanding me. I understand me. It's, it's a good relationship, always professional, you know. But um, this is a point and um, you have to be always, yeah, there are also a story about Thomas and me because I'm, um, he was so young and um, when he, he was getting so good so quickly and uh, Louis van Gaal put him in every match and he was scoring and Bayern Munich said uh, he's too young to give interviews now uh, because it's too much for him at the moment. And um, But I wanted to speak to him uh, because I didn't know him. I, Schweinsteiger I knew before, Philipp Lahm I knew before, but Müller, he was so quick in his career so I didn't have a chance. Um, but he was playing for the under-21 team of Germany and normally I should go to a match of, Bayern, uh, of of the German A national team at Schalke, I remember, but I, I decided to fly to Rimini to a match against uh, Germany under 21 against San Marino. Okay. <laughs> and, to, and I asked there for an interview and it was possible because uh, there he was a big player and not a, one yeah. of the small who isn't allowed to talk. And um, Thomas uh, knew me already a little bit from uh, the press conferences of the others and the uh, then he said to me, you're coming from, from me 
Now to Rimini, you can leave me every day in Munich. We're five kilometers away. Yeah. But you, you're flying down. For me, yeah, yeah I, I want to talk to you, Thomas. And then he, he was saying, okay, but I know that Bayern Munich didn't allow that I talk with you. And this was a very, very good trick of you. And I said, sorry, Thomas, I tried. I said, it's okay, we're doing the interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you got to be smart about it. You know, I, I think uh, I've, I know my dad well enough to know how he operates as well. Like in terms of trying to gain access, if you go by the book, so to speak, you have to be creative and a bit uh, unconventional in, in your solutions and a bit, uh, I don't know, a bit, uh, what, a bit cocky almost in your approach. And I think that's, uh, that's the distinction there. Um, I would be curious on, you know, you talk about traveling to under 21s there and, being outside while you know from the first guy on the field to the last one off the field if you could narrow it down what do you think has been your greatest strength in getting to where you are today hmm. oh, it's a i'm going deep with you here maybe i should have held it for uh, 10 more minutes <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's always a so difficult it's like asking me which was the best story you know it's I love this chip. I think this is um, the main thing. Uh, if you're asking my wife, she hates my job. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because you're always on the phone seven days a week, but uh, it doesn't feel like um, working, if right. you like it. Because, well, uh, which, is, which is the goal. Yeah. That that must be the goal, so. if, you, if you love your job, you never have to go to work. I think that's the sentence. Yeah, exactly. And um, yes, but you know, if when, when I'm on holiday, and I know there is a, a story of summer and uh, asked my wife uh, <laughs> where I always phoned on our holidays when I was in Dublin, for example, we were in front of a castle, but I heard that uh, Yogi Löw would throw out Thomas Müller, Mats Hummels and Jerome Boateng. Mm. Uh, at this day, there wasn't uh, any visiting a castle, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, the, the highlight of the day was for my family that I invited them then in the pub to <laughs> the chips after doing the story. But I had the story, you know. And uh, but I didn't uh, felt that I lost a day. It was was a great day uh, for journalists. It was a very uh, not a very nice day for me of as fan of the three players. Yes, but. I think this is the point. Uh, if you are not on the phone at the right time, or if you say, hey, I have a day off today and I yeah. won't do anything on job, I think you're not the right person and uh, for this job. And uh, if you're always there, like Fabrizio Romano, you know, he's, you know him, he's special on transfers. Yes. I think uh, for this, I can't be like him anymore because uh, I think it's hard to say for this job, I'm too old. Because he's crazy and he's always in this uh, on the phone and always reading everything. Yeah. Uh, that's why I have I have too many things to do. <laughs> he's so good in that what he's doing. I do a little part of that on the German transfer market, a little part on the English. But he's everywhere and this this is great. But I think uh, this is the main point. You have to do everything, um, and you have to be sometimes hard. Um, perhaps you know the film uh, almost famous. Um, it's a film about um, a boy. It's a true story uh, who's writing for the Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, yeah, he pretends to be older. He's not allowed to write there, but he, he's following a band and um, he's talking with a old journalist always on the phone. I think he's an alcoholic, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but he always calling him for uh, when he can't find the right way to get his story because uh, the people of the band um Took, took him as a friend, but didn't give him the interview. They just said, hey, you're part of, of our thing, but they they don't see him as a really serious journalist. Right. And um, the old reporter says to him, um, be hard, because if you don't be hard, um, they won't accept you. Right. So this young journalist is writing every secret of the band. <laughs> it was a brilliant article in the, article in the film, uh, but, but he wrote really everything. Of right. One who was gay and another <laughs> one who was... It was really funny to see, but uh, I think uh, it's not the normal way, but I know what you want to say. Right, right, right. 
yeah, you have to be, there's a, there's a certain ruthlessness as well. And that goes on what we were talking about in terms of finding a balance between being a friend and being the journalist, which is, which is tough. Um, last question before we go into to Bayern and, and, and the German national team. We spoke to Fabrizio. First of all, it's hard to compete against a guy who doesn't sleep. So yes. <laughs> that's, that is one thing I think I empathize with you with. But we asked him a similar question when we had him on the pod earlier. And when we're reporting, when you're reporting on these transfers, obviously the information, you try and, you try and get as legitimate information as possible. And you need that, then you need access to inside sources, um, whether that's an agent working on a deal, when the club's in, involved. But I can imagine on the topic of a relationships, at times maybe you can feel a bit transactional, so to speak. What do you think, and we asked him this, what do you think are the motives for the agents and clubs or the inside sources reporting to you? Is it a way to try to control the narrative? Is it to try to have leverage over the club? How do you see that um, dynamic? I think there's three reasons, I think, always. The one is um, you have uh, people who are unsatisfied with the situation, uh, like um, perhaps players who are sitting on the bench. They're talking a little bit more than players often who are on the pitch because they want to change something. Yeah. Then there are the second group, I think, uh, are people who want to show that there's th something wrong. Because often you can talk, I think everybody should talk first in the team or in the club, but often it doesn't work and nobody want to change it and they don't see it. And then there's a big frustration because of the people uh, see that there's something wrong. And if they don't change it, they say, I give them one chance to change a second one, but a third one they won't get. So I talk to somebody else. That's why the whistleblowers are uh, also in football. Uh, it's not such an important topic like the real whistleblowers in politics or something, but uh, it's the same motive. Uh, they want to change something which is not okay for them in their view. And uh, we journalists have to listen to them and we have to listen to the others. We will check it and then we will write I hope we will write the truth between, but uh, it's sometimes, um, yes, the chance to change something. Mm -hmm. Because I remember one story, uh, a player was calling me because he was very, very angry. And a few players in the team were also very angry because Frank Ribéry uh, was uh, the darling of Uli Hoeneß and he was allowed to do everything. <laughs> and one thing was uh, throwing his uh, garbage in the garden like he did uh, in boulogne sur mer <laughs> but he was living in the in the wealthiest <laughs> part of Munich in Grunwald. Yeah. And uh, a guy of Bayern Munich had to go there and take the litter and bring it away because the neighbors were calling, this is not okay. Yeah. And, and the other players were saying, hey, nobody bring our litter somewhere. That's, that's not normal. Right. <laughs> so, so he told me, uh, uh, the player. And um, yes, and Uli Hoeneß was so angry about my story and was calling me. I said, oh, I never make a, something. Um, I call my lawyer and you will get some problems. And I said, hey, Hoeneß, you can do that, of course, because it's always hard for me uh, to prove because I don't have a photo, but I know it's true. So I will do it. And I said, uh, yes, you can do that. But uh, remember, there was one or two players or three players. I don't tell you how many, which are not OK with the situation. And what would they say? If you are doing that and show everybody that I'm a liar and everybody knows in the club it's true and you are the man who did that. Right. Do you think it's a good situation for the club? <laughs> How he said, uh, I get a call. He hang up. Then one hour he called me back and said, I changed my mind. We won't do that. I said, oh, that's nice. He said, yes, but the interview I gave you in the last week, I won't authorize. I tell somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And that's the second group. Uh, the last group is, uh, and that's why I think this one just exists, uh, is just exists in football. Some people who knows that it's just football. <laughs> they think it's a, like a little bit a show business. Uh, they know some people take it too serious and, they're telling us story because hey, it's just football. I can tell you that, and uh, right. people will have fun. And 
don't take it serious. It's just football. Right. right. It's, it, must, it must be, and for you then, it's about finding a way to, like you say, telling the truth and not and filtering what is maybe attempts at using you as well, which I can assume is, is tough. So well, you've got to be pretty like socially and emotionally pretty intelligent in terms of dealing with, with that. Because like you say, you're dealing with early Uli Hoeneß, who is a big, big character in German football, former president of Bayern Munich, and dealing with that as well. There are nuances in terms of how to deal with relationships here, which for a lot of people, like maybe, you know, they might not think of or recognize when when thinking of a journalist's job as well. Yeah. I think you just have, don't have to be afraid because, um, you know, often there are some doors getting closed because you write something. Right. But uh, especially at Bayern Munich, if one door is closing, you know the sentence, another one is going <laughs> yes, open. open yes. And then after 20 years of journalism, I know that Sometimes many doors are closed, but there will other doors because this one is closed will open there. So you don't have to be afraid. Uh, if you write something which is true, and I hope I do that. I'm not always a right, I think, but I hope the most time. Um, but uh, then it's okay to write it, but you have to talk with many, many persons. And this is also uh, what Bayern Munich especially is always thinking wrong, that there's just one person, uh, we call it Maulwurf, Okay. I don't know <laughs> what's in English. You know, it's this animal who's uh, going in the earth. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, the, the whistleblower, there's just one whistleblower in the club who's telling everything, one journalist. This is not true. As there are many people and you hear it here and you hear it there and you have to check and you have, nobody knows everything, but everybody together knows all. And you right. as journalists have to pick the news together. Right. Pimp Society can paint on anything you want. Pimp Society is a creative outlet for both you as a customer and then me as a creator. Now you can currently go on the website, fill in a form, and then you'll get, um, we'll communicate through email. Now, normally, I would say to people, go read your book to find out what is Bayern like. But unfortunately, not all our listeners are, are German readers. So would you care to explain what is it that makes Bayern Munich as a club and as an institution so special and respected within just German culture and German football? Uh, what makes it so special? And um, explain a bit of the dynamics at place between the people in power, the fans, sports director, etc. Yeah, I think this is um, the main point uh, is that uh, Bayern Munich is always ruled by players which were players before. And this is also that why my books are working because I started the book with Sally Hamicic, he was a player. Right. 20 years later, he's uh, the head of sport. Yeah. I was, I'm talking with Oliver Kahn, who's playing for Bayern Munich, and now he's the CEO. And uh, for Uli Hoeneß, I was too late uh, to saw him as a player. But uh, <laughs> when I started, he was manager, then he was um, part of the board, then he was president. You know, the people in the club are always coming back. And this makes Bayern Munich so strong because um, it's always football players which are coming back to this. There is the word Bayern family. It still exists because people who love this club. I was talking to the other day with Sammy Kufu and make an interview. He was sitting in Accra in Ghana, right. and uh, it was so great to talk with him because he, he was telling me about Bayern Munich, which a great club. He showed me the, the special Weissbier glasses, which which he has uh, in his yeah. house in Accra. He fly with <laughs> them to to Africa, and uh, this is the main point of Bayern Munich because if you uh, know the club very well, you know which uh, big heart this club has and um, that's why the people return and the people are always the same and if you are like me over 20 years with the club, you always have a relationship to somebody who's coming in, who's going out and you know he will come back. So um, this makes this club so special and that's why it works. Right. I remember a point that my, my, my father made as well. It's, it's one of those where 
it's almost as if if you haven't wor- won a World Cup or play for Bayern and whatnot, you're almost not you don't you're almost not worth listening to. It's almost like this very there is this hierarchy here in place, and it seems very strong, like you say, within the Bayern family of, of being former players there. Do you see that as ultimately a strength, or is it sometimes a, a weakness within the institution? No, no, it's uh, the main strength of Bayern Munich is um, we are talking in these times a lot of uh, uh, vaccine. Right. Uh, and uh, in Bayern Munich, they have a special vaccine. So um, Uli Hoeneß told me once uh, when, <laughs> when a player is signing his contract, he get a, a spite in his veins and the spite is filled with winning. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, every generation gives it to the next one. You know, it's right. not just signing a contract. It's learning to win from the generation before. And every young player or new player or a star player, and if it's James or it's Coutinho is coming there and said, these guys here are so crazy. They want to always win and they want to always want to win in the training. And there's not one day uh, Thomas Müller is winning everything in his life, but he want to win it again and again and he never <laughs> rest. And this is Bayern Munich, you know, you, you can be so good, you can be so famous, but but this uh, mentality, you know, Thomas Müller won't be the best player in the world. He won't be the best technical player in the world, but he's the best uh, mentality player in the world. And you have a lot of them in Bayern Munich. Absolutely. And I think that's what I get become even the older I get, the more impressed I become by that because Thomas Müller has great quality, but if on comparative to other players, it's okay. But he's not quick. He's not, he's not good at the ball. No, he's he's not a ball. little bit good at everything, maybe. <laughs> yeah, he's not uh, fast, but he's <laughs> he's uh, brilliant in that, what he's doing. Nobody knows, I think, not himself. <laughs> he's no. still brilliant. No, it's, no and it's, it's great to watch and to see that, uh, to see that so consistently. Um, I, want to, I want to go to a point here. I was talking to my father ahead of this interview, and I said, I'll... Oh, you know, I ask always ask him for tips, and he says, "You know, there's always two, three spies in the club." He says, "They're always you always know a, a bit, little bit of what's going on in the club." And the reason I'm mentioning that is, it's a different dynamic because when I I look at interviews, CEOs of German clubs, CEOs, presidents, they are being interviewed, while in England. They never talk to the press. It's it, there's a there's a certain distance um, between it. Why why do you think why do you think that is? Hmm. Yeah, you know Bayern Munich. Uh, as I told you, when I start, the older journalists are always telling me, "Oh, the times are going bad." When I was young, like you, I was sitting in the dressing room. It was made for, from wood. Uh-huh. Between Beckenbauer and Müller, and we were talking after the, the training, and it was so great. And now we are standing here waiting for the players on the parking place at their cars and talking with them at the cars and not in the dressing room. Uh-huh. And I said to him, perhaps the next generation, I will tell them, ah, it was a good time. And when I was standing at the parking place, I can talk with the players directly at the car and uh, they were waiting there and uh, well, sometimes I drove with them in the car. Oh, what was fantastic times. And now the times are true, you know. Jürgen Klinsmann came, <laughs> they make a garage, uh, the new journalists uh, don't see the players after the training anymore. But um, something is different from England and um, they know that the press is there to promote their football and if they're talking to us um, they sh- can influence because they hate as still as we open. Um, they're not writing any bullshit like uh, in some other countries. I wanted to say <laughs> any special countries now, but it's not, of course it's easier if you are sitting always in your office. You don't know the player number one and not no, no, the player number two, and you can't call him. You can't ask him. You're just writing what you are thinking. And sometimes <laughs> you are thinking some bad things when nobody is talking with you and yeah. they are losing. So you write a little bit harder. And I know when I'm writing about him, some any player, I have to think about how does he feel? Shall I call him? I call him. He is telling me something. Hey, it was because of that and that. So I will write something of that. Perhaps not all because it's just his view, but I know 
what he's thinking about it. So he's influencing my article to open his mind to me. And I know if I write something very, very wrong, next time I call him, he won't answer anymore. Right. You know, it seems then that the, the news becomes a lot more reliable, and legitimate. And like you say, if there is that distance, you are left a bit more to your, not imagination, but more so your own subjective opinion without factoring what's going on. Yeah, sometimes um, you don't know better. You know, it's it's not so you want to write something uh, which is not true, but if, if you don't have any any uh, insight. Right. You just have to, you have to fill the sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, the yeah. End. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe that's why you see so many uh, rumors, so to speak, in certain newspapers in certain countries uh, <laughs> without mentioning names. Um, uh, that's brilliant. I want to, before we go into our quick fire questions, last, you follow also the, the German national team, correct? You've been following them since 2004, I believe. Yeah. Um, which was a very disappointing tournament for, for Germany in the Euro 2004. Since then, Germany has, as a national team has, you know, has transformed itself. Hosting the 2006 World Cup seemed like a great revitalization for the country, going on then to win the World Cup in 2014, which you mentioned briefly earlier. And then obviously, the last couple of tournaments have been a bit of a disappointment. But from you having followed Germany, how have you experienced that change? And I'm not only thinking from a football standpoint, but also from a wider cultural standpoint, you know, in terms of how the people could relate to the German national team, what type of players are in the German national team, etc. How have you experienced that change? You know, our style has changed. You know, a, I was in the first the tournament that's right 2004, but I've been there uh, as a not a national reporter, but uh, I saw a few matches also as a reporter in two, 2000 and 2002. And it was another style of playing football. We called it a uh, Rumpelfußball, what <laughs> means, uh, I, I think there is no English word. Oh, but I think it's the sound of it, I think, can uh, make people imagine what that means. <laughs> yeah, it's playing, it's playing football with stones. <laughs> like about That's it. much like I do in Scotland, so it's not much different, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, then something changed um, because of a generation uh, who was technical better. It was because of coaches, a uh, lot of Joachim Löw, of course. And um, we learned to play nice football, you know. Uh, it was, I think sometimes, in, I think in South Africa, I think that was the best tournament of, of Germany. We didn't win the title, but we played the best, best football in 2010 and it was a football which was really nice to watch we were good with the ball we were quick but we didn't win but it was a very good football and then in 2014 we were at the best point we were playing very well but we were playing also uh, very with the head and we know how to win because Bayern Munich won the Champions League before we had winners and after that we didn't play the main part of German football, we didn't play this winner mentality. We didn't play, we're, we're not fighting anymore. We just were playing a nice football, a beautiful football. But if Germany is just playing the style of football, there are better teams from Brazil and Spain who play also very beautiful yeah. football, but they're better in that. So it's the mixture. And we lost the mixture in the last years. Uh, that was also a little bit of problem of Yogi Löw. I think uh, he was a, uh, like just football is a philosophy, uh, like Pep Guardiola, who thinks that the coaches and managers are winning the matches, not the player. As <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's still the players. That's right. why I didn't win the Champions League since he left Barcelona. Mm -hmm. So um, it's always a mixture. And uh, Germany uh, had a great mixture in the middle of 2014. I think 2016 we should win also. But uh, now we lost it, but we're coming back now. We have Hansi Flick, and Hansi Flick uh, knows how to play with German players. Uh, he was from Bayern Munich also very keen on German players because, you know, they bring the difference to other teams mm -hmm. because German players have something which the Spanish players and Brazilian players don't have. They're not playing so tiki-taka, but uh, they have a good mixture. 
Right. The mixture. Yes, absolutely. That's where the, for anyone who is not familiar, that's the old Gary Lineker saying that football is a game played between 22 players and Germany ended up winning. So uh, hopefully for your sake, that it continues to be the case. Um, I want to conclude with three three quick questions. Uh, it's always a recurring segment we do. I've changed it a bit for you. And this is obviously a difficult question because you have experienced a lot. But I was wondering what person or p- several people you've most enjoyed interviewing or reporting on that what has given you maybe whether that is most joy fulfillment laughs whatnot it's an easy question <laughs> it's, it's okay good it's it's louis van Gaal because when you <laughs> talk to him you never know what will happen you know you can't be sure also if he likes you uh, he can destroy you in the next second if it's not the thing he wants to hear from the question or he's thinking different so I think I was never been so good prepared going to an interview or a press conference at the times of Louis, uh, because uh, if you didn't have the right answer in the right moment, uh, the interview can be completely another one. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. You feel like you're at a pupil at a school almost. Yes. <laughs> what is your greatest uh, Bayern Munich memory or München memory? It sounds a little bit crazy, but I think uh, that's always telling. I'm telling my son because uh, he's now 14. And uh, since he's watching football, Bayern Munich is winning every year in Germany the title. Right. And I, I told him that he doesn't know what football is, with doesn't have the feeling of losing. So my best memory, and that why that sounds crazy, is the final in 1999 when I were in Newcamp, right. and uh, watching Bayern Munich losing the Champions League in <laughs> two minutes. And it was amazing. And uh, at this time, I was still a fan, and it was really very really worrying. And I had to stay in Barcelona three days more because we booked a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> it were not very funny days, but when I look back, uh, I think this was a very, very big Bayern Munich moment because uh, it was a great game. It was uh, like the Wembley goal. We didn't win the match with Germany, but we are talking about it over 50 years. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Um, and um, 1999, we lost, and it was not nice, but it was special. And two years later, uh, I've been in Mailand and we were winning. Bayern uh, Munich was winning. I've been there also. But uh, the bigger game was two years before. Interesting, interesting, interesting answer. And last question then. I usually ask, where do you see yourself in five years? But I'd like to ask, because of you as, as Bayern Insider, where do you see Bayern in five years' time? <laughs> very, very, very difficult question in these times. I think... Bayern will in five years still there where it is now. They will still be in the top five clubs in the world. But I'm a little bit afraid if you would ask me in 10 years or 15 years because um, the money which is coming in, the football which Bayern Munich doesn't take, and I'm very happy about that, Mm -hmm. uh, but they can bring a change before there were one club or two club which took this money uh, at the moment, there are too many clubs. And uh, when I hear about Super League, I uh, was very proud to buy Munich and Dortmund said no. Uh, and this can change the football. And I think if this happens, uh, we will see a Bayern Munich like in the 80s, where Bayern Munich can win titles in Germany, but didn't have a chance in Europe. Uh, I hope not that will happen. Mm-hmm. I hope uh, football will be like it is now and uh, not a football game of money. That's a good point, and it's a it's a nice little warning for anyone out there. It seems from the outside that German football stands as the last guard towards what you mentioned as a as the complete commercialization of, of football. So hopefully that can continue, and people can start to watch even more Bundesliga because it is a truly truly great league. Christian, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. It was great getting in, insight into how you work because. You are an incredible voice in German football, and to get that access, I really appreciate you uh, 
allowing me to, to, to investigate that. So thank you, Chris. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you for the invitation.